Hi everyone, Kale Kettle here. Welcome to this week's episode of the Book Chain Project. This week, Emma Milray is interviewing Jamie Russell, whose science fiction adventure, Skywake, came out this year and it's fantastic. Rip-roaring sci-fi, middle grade, grabs your attention and, and holds on tight. So I hope you really enjoy the interview. I will see you on the other side. Bye. Hi everyone, I'm just waiting for Jamie to join us. Jamie is the uh, author, Jamie Russell is the author of Skywake Invasion and we're going to be talking about it for the book chain project. Um, he should be with us any moment. Hi Kitty, hi everyone, hi Jamie. If you just request to join then I will see you hopefully pop up on my screen and now anyway while we wait for jamie to join i i enjoyed this book so much oh hi jamie i was just seeing your praises <laughs> i um i'm just saying i enjoyed your book so much and i think i've told you this before but my children saw me enjoying your book so much that they demanded I read it to them. <laughs> and because there's not enough hours in the day, uh, we downloaded the audio book. So it's been our soundtrack in the car all summer as well. Wow. So <laughs> I am very, very much in the, uh, the Skyway camp. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> and congratulations. It's, it, is, it is edge of your seat stuff. It really is. And it's, um, it's properly like really visual and really um action-packed but also it's got a lot of heart because there's some really nice relationships in it too so well done Brilliant. Thank <laughs> you. i think that really surprises people actually they start reading it and they think it's just going to be like page after page of kind of action packed yeah. and then you get to a certain point you're like oh actually there's there's a kind of um uh, a more involved storyline here about kind yeah. of, um, Ruth and um, Casey and her dad and everything. So well, I think it takes people by surprise them. But. Why don't you Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the story involves, and we'll try and avoid any spoilers. But just anybody watching, just be aware there might be a spoiler or two, and we'll, we'll try not to do that. <laughs> but why don't you tell us the premise? Because it is really, it's. I think for children who enjoy gaming, it's brilliant. But also it's really um it's got a lot of elements that you might see in kind of blockbuster films as well as though everything is there um so do you want to fill us in on on, on the uh, the plot sure okay um well i always say to people um it's uh, skywake is a story about aliens video games and what it means to be a leader um and it's basically the story about a girl called casey who discovers that her favorite online video game skywake is actually more than it seems um it turns out that it's a training tool being used by an evil extraterrestrial race called the red eyes who are planning to take the best gamers from earth and send them off into space to fight a distant war on an alien planet whether they want to go or not um and casey and her friends meet up for the first time at an esports tournament in a shopping center in london and that's where they kind of discover that things aren't as they as they should be and gamers start getting abducted and it's up to Casey and her friends who she's never met before in real life to kind of work together as a team and use all the knowledge that they have of Skywake and everything they've learned from playing the game to fight back against the aliens um, and as you said it, you know I set out to write something that was kind of action paced and uh, action packed and really pacey um, really wanted it to kind of go you know, be a page turner, um, because I was aware when I was writing it, I was just like, well, the, the target audience, obviously, uh, kids who are playing, you know, I, I think I pitched it as um, uh, a novel for um, kids who are too busy uh, playing Fortnite to read Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, I, really, I really wanted to capture that, that kind of, um, that kind of fast paced, um, action packed kind of storytelling that you might find in a video game. So it's just like, well, that's my competition. You know, my competition yeah. is there are only other books. It's really like, can I you get the people? You've, you've definitely achieved that, Jamie. It really is. And I love the way that they use their, um, I love the way they use their gaming skills and all that, that language that you, that, that you use uh, in the book. It's all things that I've heard my children saying um, when they're gaming and it, it's really authentic. It, it doesn't feel like um, 
an adult outsider trying to break into a children's world, if you know what I mean, with the gaming elements, it feels like you really know your stuff about gaming. <laughs> would you say, would, do, do you game? Do you know? I, can, a lot about... I, do. I think, I think, you know, the, the, the fact is I'm a 12 year old trapped in the body. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean that you know my generation was the generation that grew up with video games really I mean I remember where I was when I saw the very first Space Invaders machine when I must have been five years old or something and it started a love affair with video games you know yeah. I've, I've loved them ever since I've played them ever since so that kind of you know that all that language and everything was just yeah it was just the stuff that's kind of you know um seems quite normal to me but it was interesting taking the book out on submission because a lot of editors um said you know absolutely love the storytelling but we don't feel like we're the right person for this book because we don't understand this world <laughs> game or anything yeah. so it was um it was quite interesting to see that there's a real generational gap i think because yeah. i talk to my kids you know my kids are like 14 and 10 and you speak to them they have a sense of people or are you a gamer or not game and they're just like yeah. that's just, you know that's what everybody does you play yeah. video games. It's not, you know it's not a big deal whereas i think for our generation people played them maybe when they were kids and then a lot of people put them aside and never went back to them and then yeah. some people like me you know stayed um stayed playing them well i'm glad you <laughs> did because it's really good um as well as the gaming elements because i don't want to just focus on that because that's only i mean it's a large part of it that there's almost it's almost like this gaming world becomes real and they're using those gaming skills to to navigate through this really tricky situation but there is at the heart of it a um it's all about the relation the family relationships between a, a brother and sister and a father who is absent um and it's it's really emotional i've i found myself feeling really sad in the flashback bits not in a bad way <laughs> um but really emotionally involved um in the flashbacks because you see that lovely family environment but also the um kind of hard hard to navigate relationships between parents and children when children think that perhaps there's a favorite or they're not getting enough attention i just thought it was just really really beautifully done especially when it's a it's an action-packed you know edge of your seat story to have this lovely discussion about family relationships in it as well is really nice how important was it to you to have that father-daughter relationship kind of at the heart of the book i always knew it was going to be there through the writing process it kind of i realized how important it was you know um once i started writing and there's only so much i mean even as a writer you know action pack chapter after action pack at a certain point you're like oh, i could do with a break now you know let's just let's just regroup and have something a, a little <laughs> bit of contrast um and so it really it really mattered from that point of view and i was really careful where i, I put the flashbacks and there's only three chapters that flashbacks in the novel and I was really careful where they went to get the kind of maximum emotional impact out of them um and I'd still remember the moment I, in my head I was like well you know he's the dad's a gamer and he's taught the kids about video games and stuff so you know you need to have a game that they've kind of played that can maybe be important and I remember I was sat in a cafe writing and I was just like of course it's Space Invaders isn't it you know it's like, <laughs> It's the most kind of, you know, yeah. apt thing for them to be playing a retro game. So this whole idea of they go and find the Space Invaders cabinet yeah. kind of and it up and rewire it and get it playing again. And then the dad teaches her about playing Space Invaders, you know, um, which is a really simple game uh, in terms of mechanics. But it just seemed perfect for the kind of um, uh, making that relationship between the work and bring out the kind of, you know, what was happening in the rest of the novel as they are actually, you know, fighting and I really like the, the the fact that you had that um that big cabinet with the game in because because of the dad's job and I don't want to give anything away but because of the dad's job you see him being very mechanical and like being so really skilled and um you kind of know what's what's coming you can get a feel for what's coming when you find out what his job is uh -huh. I felt like that was a really lovely kind that was a really lovely detail to have in there that his job is something to do with making like attention to very very much small details in mechanical works um so i i thought that was brilliant i also really loved that um where it's set because um it's well I it's not giving any spoilers to say that it's the majority of the book is set in um what was it the majority at least over half of the book is set in a, in a shopping center and um 
it made it really easy for my children and me to picture it. Um, you can almost imagine it as a film. Everybody's trapped inside this shopping centre and, and you've referred to some shops that kind of I would recognise in, you know, I don't know, Westfield or the Trafford Centre or whatever. Um, but I really like what, what gave you the idea to, to do that, to have everybody in this shopping centre? Because it, it, it could feel quite claustrophobic, but it doesn't because there's so much action and then they're constantly moving. And then when they're looking down through the, all the cameras and things, you can really picture it because it's such a familiar location to everybody. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think it, there were only a certain number of places where you could probably set something like this without it being really boring. And I knew it had to be an esports tournament that they went to. And if you think about that, it's kind of like, oh, it's going to be in a kind of bland kind of warehouse kind of building or something. You know, I was like, it has to be somewhere that's going to feel interesting. And I remember as a kid walking around shopping centres and always being really interested in what's behind the door that's like no entry. Yeah. <laughs> what's kind of behind the scenes. And they always feel like fantastic places to play, you know? Um, yeah. I wrote, years ago, I wrote a book about zombie movies and I was a huge fan of zombie movies and the classic zombie movie, of course, is Dawn of the Dead, where the whole, the whole thing takes place in a shopping centre. Right. You know, as the zombie the hammering on the doors trying to get in. And I just love that idea of... Um, uh, something really um, familiar that we all kind of recognise, but it's kind of turned on its head. So suddenly, you know, here you are in a shopping centre and there's zombies at the door, or there's aliens from outer space kind of, you know, storming through the place, shooting everybody. And, yeah. And people, so. <laughs> no, I think it's just brilliant. I love it. Um, I'd, if for anybody who doesn't know your your background is in um, in kind of in the film industry, isn't it? So how much... Um, how much of how much are you inspired and uh, by films and how much would you say you're inspired by books because that's something I always struggle with I think I'm probably as a child I did read and I loved reading I read more as a, a teenager and I did a degree in English so I did a lot of reading kind of in my twen early 20s um, after that but um, I'd say when I'm actually sat down writing and visualising things, I do think back a lot more to films I've seen. And I don't know if it's part of my brain that works in a different way, but having maybe I'm a visual person, but when I've seen something, I'm more inspired by it, perhaps for creating. I don't know. Do you feel like um, your background in film has really fed into your writing career? Um, I would say definitely, yeah, hugely so. Um... Weirdly, start, I started off as a film critic, which meant watching like loads of movies every week, which is a great job. I'm not, yeah. you know, not boring, but it took a lot of stamina, you know, you watching yeah. 10 movies a week or something. Oh, it was a great way of kind of exposing yourself to kind of story, you know, and getting a, a real, even if you're not thinking about it, just constantly yeah. consuming the stories. And then as a screenwriter, I managed to, I did eight years as a screenwriter, made a living of it without actually getting any movies made, which was just like, you know, just, <laughs> terrible creatively but a really great place to learn about um uh, story and um putting stories together and but i agree i think what you said was really interesting about watching movies and taking kind of inspiration from them as a writer and i definitely do that a lot i think and i wonder if maybe you know talk about video games as a generational thing but i also maybe wonder for us as writers maybe it's also the same i mean you know we grew up with vhs you know, you know uh, yeah. video or whatever we probably watch more movies than any generation before us has done you know yeah. just at home kind of just consuming all this stuff and, and watching them good. over and as a, as a child and teenage yeah. watching it over and over again and kind of reciting bits of dialogue with friends and things like that I know I did that a lot and I think when I'm writing dialogue or if I'm writing a scene that's very like your book action-packed um I do channel those the films that I've seen perhaps more than the books that I've read. That's not to say I don't love reading, I do, but there's something different when you're creating. I think you need to be able to see it. Um, and I, I definitely think your background in being a film critic, you must have so many ideas to draw on f for that. I think it's, it's brilliant. I think it's, um, I think there's some truth. I think that idea of what you're saying as writers about finding that visual um, having that visual sense, I think, is something that um, that's really key because you you quite often, particularly if it's an action-packed book, you know, with a lot of action or or world building, you know, yeah. like your book, yeah. um, you know, building 
something that's really quite different you're just like okay i really need i need the reader to be able to see this you know i really need them to be able to understand how this world works um or where this action is taking place or how it's going to unfold and i think for that you need a that that kind of visual sensibility is really really important. yeah 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 definitely so um I know I've got a list of questions and we've just kind of gone off on a tangent and just had a chat, which is lovely, but I should probably uh, stick to some of the, <laughs> some of the book chain questions. Um, so how long, how long has your book been out now? It's, it's a couple, is it a couple of months? Yeah. So it came out 1st of July. So yeah, right. coming up for a couple of months. And what have you most enjoyed about being a published author? Uh, it is fantastic actually to be able to just pick it up and yeah. go, and go and work here have it yeah <laughs> and whether you want to or not here have a coffee yeah everything. um certainly what was really weird about writing screenplays for so long was nobody wants to read screenplays i mean producers and directors don't even want to read screenplays <laughs> weird things you know they're not and, and also they're they're unfinished things you know they're, they're kind of like a blueprint or something you need a whole team to come together to like bring it to life so you, you can't really say to someone someone says oh what do you you know what do you do and i hold up right it's okay well, you know it's like well can i see it yeah <laughs> no it's, it's you know, <laughs> 200 pages of something that i wrote nobody wants to read that but with a book it's lovely because you're like it's the finished product you know yeah. there's no um, there's no kind of um process that needs to be gone through to um that prevent you from just giving it to someone to read. So that's that's the loveliest thing I think actually about being published for me is just being able to have that finished thing and go there you go and take it. I think that read. that's why when when authors get their author copies and they do unboxing videos, the sheer joy of holding like however many months or years of work in your hand, so it's real. Um, yeah, I definitely get that. It, it, it is a very kind of hold it in your hands dreams come true kind of thing isn't it no, 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 oh there we go <laughs> there i am and there you are brilliant <laughs> um this is a tricky question because the answer might be nothing but is there anything that you haven't enjoyed about being um an author um it's weird because i feel like as an author um i think it was I think it was Kate Mallinder I heard say this. She said, you never want to say that your diamond shoes are pinching because you're kind of aware that like, it's such a privileged position to be yeah. in. You really don't feel like, I don't feel like I can complain about anything. I have a book, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, if I was being honest, I find um, this part of the process quite not me. I don't really like being the focal point of attention. So to sit and have to be interviewed and do videos and do publicity and everything, um, that for me is probably is probably one of the hardest bits. And it would be lovely to live for me, it would be lovely to live in a world where like nobody's, you know, they're just like, oh the book, there you go, that's done. You're done now. You don't have to do any more. Go and write another book. I think I'll that's really true of a lot of authors, you know, Jamie, because um I heard someone say that um the majority of authors are kind of uh, introverts who like to build their own world and who enjoy writing but that's totally at odds to being extroverts who can just go out into the world and shout about themselves do you know what I mean it's I think there are a lot of authors who find it a little bit jarring that they are um they are kind of in this in this bubble writing their book for however long it takes and then the bubble pops and there are other people looking in the bubble, you know, you can almost imagine you're in a you're in a glass box and you feel protected with curtains all around you, and then the the curtains dropped and you're there and you've got to shout about yourself and and it doesn't come naturally to a lot of us, I don't think. But the great thing I think that we've I don't want to speak for you, but I think what we've found is if you find a community of authors who you can say, you know, this is amazing, this is brilliant but I'm finding it really hard to do videos. I've done 17 takes of a 20 second reel for a school. Am I normal? And everyone says, yeah, you're totally normal. It's quite nice. I think if you find your community, they can bring you up um, when you're feeling kind of out of your depth. Would you agree? Really I would completely. And we're really lucky because as you were hinting at, we're both part of the debut 2021 group and you know yeah. it's just been a fantastic group and wonderful things like the book chain project have come out yeah. of it and everything else you know um just um uh been so wonderful to connect with other people in the same position other debut authors and and as you say i mean i think i think you're right as in i think it's something that a lot of authors don't like having to do the whole um uh, publicity round um 
but you know i mean equally it's I think we're all slightly egotistical as authors, aren't we? I mean, you have to be to be, to be you know, yeah. your book on people and expecting them to pay money to read something that you've made up in your head. I think there's a slight amount of ego. But I do think maybe part of us actually quite likes it. Secretly, yeah, as well, you know, no, I think so. I saw something on Twitter the other day. Someone put just a really simple tweet saying, um, saying, um, there's nothing more embarrassing than writing a book. <laughs> and I thought, well, there have been times when I've been quite embarrassed that I'm like, this is my book. I actually thought, you know, it would be a good idea to write it. I hope you think so too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I get that. We are, I, we, I we do want, we do want the praise <laughs> and for people to notice us, but at the same time, we kind of shy away a little bit. It's, a conundrum. <laughs> yeah. I have to say the most miserable I think I've been for a long time was about the fortnight before publication and I was just my wife's looking at me like she's like why are you why have you got such a long face this is what you've been waiting for and I was just like I feel like I don't know I'm just about to walk out in the street kind of naked and everybody's yeah. just gonna laugh at me and everybody's gonna feel like I'm putting something of myself out into the world yeah it's really really quite scary. I think so. that's natural. Um, another question that I really like on our list of book chain questions is what's your writing kryptonite? So is there anything where throughout the process, whether it's when you start or whether you, when you're editing structural that or line edits or whenever that just, it just switches you off and you're like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> Um, oh, that's interesting. I, I, when you said that, I thought you were maybe going to say, you know, what kind of stops you from writing, which when I was going to say social media. Well, that's there you go. Really Actually, cool. that's probably a better interpretation <laughs> of the question. Because <laughs> um, Twitter is just the worst thing. It hits all the dopamine centers in my brain, you know, the instant nature of it and everything. And it can really stop me writing completely. So much so that I actually bought an app on my laptop that will limit my ability to access Twitter to like, 10 minute chunks a day at certain times. Oh, wow. And I moved my wife with a passcode in so that I can't turn it off. I mean, short <laughs> of people, you're wiping the whole hard drive. There's no way to stop it. Yeah. Um, but you know, I can waste a lot of time with it. Yeah. I'm convinced that I'm actually doing some work, you know, like, oh, I'm connecting with other authors or saying something about And it's like, no, I should be writing. So, yeah, that's the, that's yeah. the one. No, I, um, I, yeah. No, I get that. Yeah. The other one you said about um, stages of the process. Um, I don't know actually which one I find the hardest. Editing is hard, definitely. I find that that stage outlining is hard as well, and editing. And the stage between those is actually quite nice. I'm kind of like, oh, that's the discovery phase. And then the other the other side of that always feels like really hard work. Outlining is hard when you've got that blank piece of paper. You're like, I've got an idea, and then you start outlining. You're actually, it's not an idea. It's just <laughs> the formula of something. And now I need to really play it hard. Um, and then editing it when you realise that everything that you thought was possible was actually not at all. <laughs> now you need to yeah. make it all. Yeah. yeah. No, that's I think I think that's definitely true. Especially when if an editor says this element doesn't work, and you kind of think, well, can we just pretend it does work? <laughs> because it sounds like a lot of work for me to change it now. <laughs> and you, I, I was rehearsing conversations in my head thinking how can I justify keeping that in because to take it out seems like a lot of work and it there must be a way and I would battle with that for a few days and then eventually I'd be like do you know what I probably could have rectified it by now if I hadn't just been avoiding doing it so I'm just going to sit down and get on with it and do what I've been told to do because they're right they know what they're doing <laughs> um if you could tell your younger writing self anything what would it be? That's a hard one because you've been writing in one form or another for a long time, whether it's scripts or reviews or obviously now novels. But what would you tell your former writing self? You know, it's funny you say that because when I look back at my writing career, so I've been writing for 20 years and I've been writing, but I feel like it's taken me the best part of that time to actually write what I always wanted to be writing all along, which was like, I was always like, I want to write fiction. And I was so scared to write fiction that I ended up doing everything but. So um, I started off, um, I did a PhD just to, to write 
just to keep writing. <laughs> um, and that ended up as a book. So that was the first thing I published. Then I became a critic, so a film critic. And I was like, I'm writing loads, you know, whatever. But none of it's, you know, it's all about other people's kind of creative work. Um, and then um, it was only in 2012 that I was like, I had a, a brush with, uh, with death and was like, actually, I need to, I really need to... Um, Kind of focus on what I want to do. So okay, yeah. so I really want to write fiction. So went off and started writing screenplays, um, and then kind of you know finally got to the point of like, oh okay, now I'm writing the novel. And I actually think this is what I probably should have been doing all along. But it's just it was just pure fear of kind of of fiction. I think like writing nonfiction is really different. It's a yeah. much easier sell to yourself and to the audience. You don't feel like you're having to take people on a journey in quite in quite the same way. Whereas writing fiction, I think you really need to have some confidence that people are going to be invested enough in what you're doing and saying to want to share the journey with you. Yeah. That was, that's, been, that's been a really interesting, you know, two decades worth of experience to get to this point, realisation. of. Um, so if I was speaking to my younger self, I'd just be like, just don't be afraid, you know, just just write. And then and keep writing and don't expect it to be good. Because, you know, I wrote some fiction in my early 20s, it was absolutely terrible. And it was so bad that I was just like, I'm never, I just can't do this. So I'll never <laughs> do it. <again." laughs> and I think, I, think, I think we can be quite hard on ourselves as writers. I don't know if you've found this, that we can, we can expect to hit it out of the park on the first swing. And it's just like, actually, the whole process of writing is just failing again and failing better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I, think that, I think that's really true. Because I think a lot of people have said to me, since they found out that I've written a book is a lot a lot of people have said oh I've always wanted to write a book or I've got this story that I really want to tell and I just feel like saying to them just do it <laughs> just do it um but it sounds really patronizing. it sounds like I'm saying well I did it you should do it too I'm sure it'll be fine but it really is just do it and see how it goes because I think a lot of people um would think that it's um this amazing experience and it's wonderful and I know people who started to write and thought actually do you know what I've got this story I want to tell but I'm not really enjoying writing I, I'm finding anything to do apart from write it down and that's kind of a sign that perhaps you don't really want to write if you're finding everything to avoid doing the thing you think you want to do <laughs> um, and if you're not enjoying the pro if you're not enjoying the core job of sitting down in your own world and writing, whether you get published or not, um, it's probably not for you. But I, I do think everybody has a story that they think that they want to tell and that deserves to be told. I went to a festival um, this last weekend, uh, uh, um, the Just So Festival, it's a, it's a family one, and there was a storyteller there and he was he was so engaging and I kept thinking I wonder if he writes his stories down like I write my stories down but then I thought well there's no need there's no reason why he would have to write his stories down because he's he's got this tale he wants to tell it's really interesting the children are lapping it up it's it's magical listening to him why why does he need to write it down that's his job is to story tell in front of people so um, I can't even remember what the question was now, but <laughs> I, I definitely think that um, if you've got a story to tell and you're not enjoying writing it, that doesn't mean the story is not valid. It just means that you don't want to be a writer. Yes, I think that's really true. <laughs> and I think everybody thinks everybody thinks writing is this really romantic kind of profession, and it's and it's whatever. And, it's, and the truth is, it's bloody hard work, and yeah. it's quite exhausting. You know, most of yeah. the time. And I think the joy of writing is later on in the process it's not the process itself so much most of the time it's actually having written rather than writing yeah. I find anyway I really like that I've written yeah that's great you know it's fantastic yeah um but the actual process itself is is, is hard you know you, you're really trying to build something out of nothing and it makes your brain hurt and it's, yeah, yeah it's so your book is going to be a, a trilogy that's right isn't it it is yeah so is. when when can we expect to and if you know three and are they written uh yeah so two is um at the line edit stage right um so just about done uh which is may 2022 and uh three is 
um, in the writing stage, the drafting stage, right. first draft, um, and that is May 2023. Oh, brilliant. Um, well. So, yeah, so um, uh, the next couple of years are kind of mapped out, which is really weird because I'm kind of so far ahead in the process. Yeah. Um, the first one got quite delayed. It was quite a long lead time anyway from the publishers, and then COVID hit. Yeah. And things got quite delayed. So I was quite far ahead of myself in the planning of the trilogy than I probably would have been at this stage. So yeah. my editor is very happy with me. Oh, she's always like, yes, great. <laughs> <laughs> Got all the names as well. Yeah, so. Well, I, I, I'm really excited for book two because I don't want to give any spoilers, but there's a really big twist at the end that I 100% didn't see coming. Did you, did you always plan for that? Um, weirdly, the very, the original draft that my agent read uh, kind of was when she read it she was like I think you're trying to do too much in book one so there was quite a lot that was book two that was in book right. one so the ending was slightly different and I have to say that ending so many people are cross with me about that ending because it's so <laughs> clear I really have been saying I don't know do, I think so long till the next book as well you know it's not like oh it's you know in a month's time yeah. or something but uh, yeah it's a real clip in the moment I was a bit like I was a bit gutted because I want I wanted a certain ending, but now some time has passed since I've finished it and I've come to terms with it. <laughs> um, I think it's genius. I think it was brilliant, a brilliant way um, for it to end because it really like hits you like a ton of bricks. It's brilliant. Um, I mean, it's purely, it's purely kind of self-interest as well, because obviously if you end it like that, everyone's going to say, well, I have to read book yeah. two now. <laughs> But, but I think it's kind of like the uh, arcade machines, you know, it's like insert coins yeah. to continue. <laughs> but children will remember, children will remember what happened at the end because it's so like wow. Um, so when book two comes out, they are definitely it's not like it's petered out and oh, look, there's another, there's another installment. It is properly, I need the second book because I need to know what happens next. It's very clever. <laughs> It's great from the writer's point of view as well, actually. Yeah. It's, it's that thing, you know, uh, there's a famous thing about, you know, you should end your writing on the day so that you can pick it up the next day and, yeah. and keep going. And it feels like that between the books because it's just like, well, you know, there's no like, how do I start the next book? It's like, well, no, it just picks up exactly where the first one left off. So, yeah. you know, you're instantly, instantly away. So, yeah, I would highly recommend doing that if you ever need to write, <laughs> to write an apology. You'd end it on a cliffhanger. It makes everything the next yeah. one much easier. Oh, it's too late. <laughs> um, so we've come to the end of our half hour but I could honestly after we've after we've talked so much about how ill at ease we are with publicizing ourselves and our books I've really enjoyed talking to you Jamie so thank oh, you, you. <laughs> um, so we're going to end now and we're going to head over to zoom and I think if everybody follows the book chain project on Instagram and Twitter and all the socials and finds us on YouTube, then at some point in the future, you'll be able to watch our next conversation, which will be a quick fire um, conversation with some quirkier questions. Um, and I've also been asked to remind people that if you're an author watching this and you'd like to take part in the book chain project, um, get in touch with us on the Instagram Instagram account. Okay, and so I say, quickly, Emma, before we forget, next week I'm interviewing yes. lovely Michael Mann for Ghost Cloud. Oh, fabulous! That's my turn. That's the next one in the chain. <laughs> Brilliant, lovely, well, well remembered because I did forget the last notes on the instructions. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jamie. That was lovely, and thank you, thank you for giving up your time. See you later. See you soon. Bye. Hi, everybody. I hope you really enjoyed that episode. Next week, Jamie is going to be interviewing Michael Mann. Michael Mann's uh, first book, Ghost Cloud, came out this year. We've had a lot of debuts in quick succession. Um, we That will change shortly. Um, but Michael, I'm really proud of Michael. He was one of my mentees as part of the Scooby Undiscovered Voices program. And uh, he's produced an amazing middle grade book. Uh, which I hope you enjoy and I hope you enjoy the interview with him next week. Don't forget, if you're a writer, you can apply klkettle.com. Look at the information down below and we hope to hear from you and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye.